Now, as you can see from the bookshelf over here, which is usually to my left when I'm recording, I do like a good book. But what goes in to making the books that we know and love the things that they are? And then what happens when we review them? Luckily, my guest today, Andy Wright of Aircrew Book Review, isn't just a book reviewer, he is also an editor. So we're going to be looking at what goes into editing a book and helping it from the author's laptop, typewriter, whatever, through to the finished product and onto our bookshelves behind us. Because Andy's blog, Aircrew Book Review, takes his passion for all things military history, lots of aviation titles as well, and gets some sometimes slightly more obscure titles out to us because, after all, Andy is Australian. So therefore, there is a lot of Australian content out there because that place has a fantastic aviation history. Of course, if you want more aviation history, we have to thank our incredible partners at the Pima Air and Space Museum who have much in the way of aviation history in the hundreds of aircraft they have on display there. Cannot thank them enough for their continued support of the podcast. And of course, if you'd like to become a damn Kestir and support the podcast more directly, check out the link in the description below. Just three pounds a month plus a bit of that. You get these episodes ad free early and with a specific intro to each one on the Patreon feed. All from just three quid a month and it keeps the lights on here, like that one up there. But we're going to get into some book reviews because Andy's going to talk to us about editing and we're going to review three or four books as well, including one that isn't out yet. Well, we're not going to review that one. We're going to really just sing its praises. So if Ian Campbell is listening, buckle up. I hope you like what we have to say about it. So without further ado, Andy Wright, book editor extraordinaire, and of course, the man behind aircrew book review welcome to the damcasters brought to you in association with the pima air and space museum i'm your host matt Bowen. andy thank you so much for joining us i have the important question to ask as as a big reader of books i've heard a lot about the editing process this is my first chance to actually sit down with it with an editor what do you do because i i in in the magical in the magical brain the writer sits down and writes his beautiful prose, kills his darlings, gets it down to a, a reasonable size, and it appears on my bookshelf a little bit later. But that, that's not the case, is it? So what, what, what is the day job for crafting, crafting a good edit on a book? Uh, well, I often come to a book uh, that can be fairly well advanced or it can be a manuscript straight from the author. So the, the real... I guess classic proper editors are the ones who work for the publishers and, uh, you know, really bash a manuscript into shape. I say that when a book comes to me from a publisher, it's often quite well, quite nice already. And it's, I'll be doing either a style edit or, a, and a little bit of fact checking, uh, historical side of, side of things. Uh, but I, because I also work directly with authors as well, I'll get a manuscript that can be, um, needs a bit of work, to put it nicely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I mean, it, it's, it's always, it's always a privilege to, uh, work on someone's book. Uh, it doesn't matter who it is. It could be a you know, first time author or someone working on his 10th book or 20th book, um, or 50th. And so it remains a privilege. Um, and that, that's, that's the one thing that I've always, always try and keep in mind is I've, I need to, respect the work they've done, uh, but also I see my job as making the author look even better than they already do. Uh, and sometimes that involves I don't have any contact with the author and other times I'll work directly with them, as I said. So it's, yeah, it, it, it's different every time. <laughs> and, I mean, I, it can be just working on a straight word document uh, you'll get sent photos embedded in the Word document, which is not a lot of fun. Um, so you, you, then, uh, you then have to go back and say, can I have <laughs> the document <laughs> and any, any images? But then, of course, you've got to work on captions and there's bibliographies and notes, be they footnotes or endnotes to work on as well. So everything is, mm -hmm. yeah, 
So, fair bit of work. So are, are you looking at sort of readability, grammar, that sort of thing? Are, are you doing, are you going as deep as a fact check or, or are you just looking, how is this going to come across to, to a Muppet like me when I get my hands on it? <laughs> I, a bit of everything, really. It's, mm. uh, I'm, again, it depends on how far advanced the manuscript is. But having said that, I'll, I can get a manuscript from a publisher and you'll be going through and you'll just go, Hang on, Tick. That seems a bit odd uh, from a fact checking point of view. And you can go in and go, well, hang on, Tick. No, for argument's sake, the going back to your previous podcast that you've just had on the B17 and that, no, the ball turret came before the waist positions, sort of thing, not around the other way. So you kind of like, go, hang on, Tick. <laughs> um, but the, and there's always, there's always grammar, readability that sort of thing to, that comes with every manuscript. Uh, often the, the, pub, the stuff that comes from straight from the publishers is a lot better, but then you also have your natural or natural writers who have this flow and it's really just a case of finessing what they've got, uh, maybe tightening it up a bit. And uh, well, you've got to try and keep the author happy too, which can be a bit of a challenge. I mean, it is a bit baby, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears go into it, and, and and some guy comes back and says, "Do you really want to be saying this?" Yeah. Well, exactly right, and it's it's years, often years, sometimes decades of where their work, mm -hmm. and to some extent, they're not going to see the wood for the trees. So, having someone who's only just got hold of the thing, and not necessarily tear it apart, but start critiquing it, you get different reactions uh, from authors. Mm -hmm. Some often. Usually the ones that I don't have much contact from contact with because I work through publishers, uh, they'll come back and go, you know, along the lines of who is this guy? What's he? <laughs> <laughs> and you, and that, that, that's, that's, that's when you have to kind of, you have to back up. You have to be prepared to back up what you're critiquing. You know, my specialty of, I, I suppose is the aviation of the second world war. Uh, but funnily enough, I don't do a lot. Of manuscripts in that period, so it's um, sometimes I think, oh God, geez, it'd be nice to be doing something like I kind of know almost back to front, but uh, but therein lies the variety of life, I suppose. Uh, and but things like, for example, say you're reading something and it goes on, and the 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 two Royal Navy battleships that were sunk by the Japanese, you know, in late 1941. And you, mm -hmm. we've lost with all hands. And you're like, really? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, Prince Wales Repulse, which of course Repulse was a battlecruiser, but yeah, I'm turning yeah. up the can of it. Uh, they weren't lost with all hands. No, it's, a, it's an so. important distinction. I'd, I'd call that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's the sort of thing that is part of how I sell myself or how to sell my services, I should say, uh, in that I have that background knowledge as a specialist, I suppose, military history editor that you kind of get a bit of a nose for this this sort of thing but a lot of my work recently has been vietnam a uh, little bit of korean war a lot of cold war and not even aviation <laughs> so it's, how, how could it's, how could you so? i know it, there's been a lot of army army u.s army stuff uh i've been i've recently done a book on afghanistan a u.s army airborne unit uh running a, a post there in the uh mm -hmm. Uh, Dan Jab Valley, or I should know how to say it, but I don't know. And that was one of those books that you're sitting there reading. You had to remind yourself you're the editor because it was just it just sucked me in, and yeah, it was phew, phenomenal read. Uh, but you've got to remind yourself and step back. Yeah, yeah, that you've got to go. I've got to remain a bit objective here because this, I'm I really like these guys, and I don't want them to. <laughs> I don't want anything to happen to them. So, but that book, um, which I remember the name of it, uh, if I get a chance, that book is The Devil's Playground by uh, Andrew Bragg, B R A W G, okay. if anyone's keen on it. Just been released, and that is kind of gets a point across about Afghanistan. Um, and he's, I've said, he's a voice of his generation. He's, he's really an impressive book, but of course, it's, it's not aviation. So, <laughs>
we're always happy to champion a good read on this show, so which is what we're going to get onto in a minute. But so that that was going to be one of my questions. You, you're not just specialist aviation. You you you'll take what you can get to, to pay the yeah, bills. I suppose I'll, I'll do whatever someone pays me to do. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, the, I, I find myself I'm much more comfortable doing aviation, uh, and mm. I've I mean I've done US civil I've done a US civil war book as well, which was frustrating from the point of view of the big thing I got out of it was, I mean, it was a good read, but the big thing I got out of it was you've just attacked that position. Why are you going to do exactly the same thing again? You know, yeah. the, several hours later and just the same result. It was like, oh, but that really, the futility, futility of war and all that. So yeah, mm. it's, yeah, so de- definitely not um, specialist, oh, specialist aviation, but definitely not uh Hundred percent working in that area. So yeah, the, the the American Civil War is interesting in that the the chimes and the echoes that go forward to the First World War are are very similar and you know, not repeating itself. Things like that, but the sort of tactical problems are are quite something. But you have all the other stuff which makes yeah Civil War books quite problematic at times. Go back and see the old podcast I did with Sarah Churchwell about Gone with the Wind <laughs> back in the day, and yeah, you'll 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 see my feelings on that. But there, I, I guess how long it takes is is a variable depending on where you enter the process, isn't it? So it's you you, yes. you can't really just sort of say, "Oh, this one's going to take me six weeks, and we'll be good to go." It's going to be an ongoing process depending on how. Because I, I suppose because you could get one that starts really well and then has lots of issues towards the end, and that. Advice Absolutely, person. it's um, yeah. yeah it, I work with a publisher uh, out of the UK that's also uh, based in America, um, and prolific publisher of pretty decent mm. books, actually, mm. bloody good books. Uh, and they set me a deadline of usually about a fortnight, uh, which, when you're running kids around and you've got another job and. <laughs> <laughs> a garden that's out of control and house renovations, it becomes a bit of a challenge to uh, to turn something around in a fortnight. But uh, it does get done. Easier when it's a 50,000-word manuscript and not 150,000 words. <laughs> but um, then at least with the 50,000 one, you can turn it around early. You know, you've scored yourself some points for um, for getting it back to the mail. <laughs> so, but, um, there's a book. I've got piles of books here. Actually, I've got piles of books anyway. But there's a book here, uh, just this one, for example, this is by Elian. Mm-hmm. Uh, Salvo is Italian, and the book was originally written in Italian, and then he translated it into English. So my job was to clean up the English, and this this is working with Salvo directly. Then quite a bit of back and backwards and forwards uh, between us mm-hmm. as things were changing, and I think the whole process was probably eighteen months off the top of my head. Okay, definitely a year, and. Part of that was because we got it to a certain stage where we presented it to the publisher and then the publisher has its own style guide that they want things to be presented as or how they want them to see the manuscript. So pretty much had to go straight back through the whole thing and do the manuscript as they wanted. Uh, always a bit hard because when you're preparing a manuscript, you don't know which publisher is going to accept it. Mm-hmm. So... Especially, you know, obviously, if they're applying to several publishers, so the the goal there is just to ensure there's consistency throughout. So, effectively, apply an agreed style guide that you've agreed with the yeah. author, and uh, yeah, pretty much go from there and hope the publisher likes it, which obviously they did, and that that is a very good book too. So, quite enjoyed that one. I, ha- mm, I have I have seen that pop up. It's 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 on the long list of oh, I should really get that. I haven't, I haven't got oh, right. any, anything yeah. with Malta on it, and it was an absolute again. It was an absolute privilege to work on, but anything to do with Malta, I'm an absolute sucker for. So <laughs> it can be naval, it can be air force. Just I've never been there. I think uh, one wonderful place. We 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 got married. I think uh, the same weekend in 2005 when the Spitfire and Hurricane went there mm-hmm. for Merlin's over Malta, and I was we were we were yeah. actually in Santorini to get married other end of the Mediterranean, had I have known, <laughs> I probably would have yeah, been trouble, actually. But yeah, <laughs> yeah that, my, oh, my yeah. was eternal fascination for me, so. 
I can't recommend it highly enough for people to visit. I, I was there for working with Air Malta for a while. And, and knowingly, I never got up to Valletta Cathedral to see um, the Caravaggio, uh, the heading of St. John, which <laughs> means I'm just going to have, have to go back and do all the other stuff as well. But I, I adore the place. It's fantastic. But we're not here to talk about holiday destination. So I, I guess, you know, let, let's, let's, let's ask about your babies. Is, is, is there a book? Because what we're going to do, we're going to chat about your we'll say the hobby side of it, the, the book review in a minute, but yeah, of yeah. the books you've worked on, are, are there any that sort of jump out at you and say that came out really well, whether, whether it was just a quick one you had to polish or whatever, but is, is there, is there a couple that you're, you're proud of that you want to give a uh, shout out to? Yeah. I, as I said, I've got a couple of piles here. <laughs> um, the, but the devil's <laughs> playground, I haven't seen the devil's playground in the flesh yet. Uh, Cause it's only just been released uh, that. Well, I'm hoping that's as good as it, as it read when I got through it. But um, there's a couple from Casemate that I did in the past couple of years and aviation. So uh, mm. you will have you'll be familiar with this one. Yes. It was mm. absolutely, absolutely superb. Um, again, reading through it and the the various uh, anecdotes and uh, quotes that it's got from various people and also uh older books on the subject on the 381st bomb group, just the way they drew it all together, just kind of worked. <laughs> and, and it's a stunning looking book, but then Casemate is very good at that. And then probably something that's a bit more local to me, uh, being in Australia, is that one, which yep. very different again from Casemate and the development of the technology, the radar released bombs that they were using, the system that they used there was really well explained. And then the actual application of that, you know, night bombing enemy ships, you know, from low level in a four engine bomber, you know, fly over, oh, look, you know, let's hope the radar releases what we want it, what, you know, does what we want it to do. And phew, yeah, quite happy with that. Uh, but then re really, just, I mean, just, sorry. just for the people who are listening to this one and not watching, that was um, Paul Bingley, Mike Peters, who I have spoken to and, Yes, been meaning to have on for, for for bomb group for ages and night stalkers as well, which another night one. I, 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 I Richard seen. Lawless. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Need to. But I mean, real, I mean, really too, too, you, you too many books. Slow down, mate. Stop, stop <laughs> oh, filling up my it's... wish list the way you are. <laughs> I mean, this is my problem. You know, <laughs> it's, yeah. Not, it's just we, yeah, it's just out on the floor. Oh. But that's you know, house renovations will uh, do that to you. But yeah. um. You ask about a favourite book, and those two stand out. But it's more the the reading of them as I was going through them with the edit, and it's just I find that every single book I work on, when I finally see a physical copy of it, it's it's my new favourite book, sort of thing. Oh, it sounds a bit uh, I don't know self centred or something, but it's it's just really good to see something that you've worked on, something that uh, you've been part of a team on, just get out into the world, get in front of as many people as possible. I mean, that, that, that's that's a lot of what I'm about with both the editing but also with Aircrew Book Review is just get these stories out in front of as many people as possible. The older stories, of course, it keeps those stories alive and the newer stories, for example, <laughs> I'll do it to you again. This is the first, I guess, book of the RWF's current campaign series that they're doing. We're up to okay. about eight or nine books now. And so as you can see, it's... The current, well, up until probably well, almost 10 years ago now, but uh, the, um, the war, war in Terry against Syria and all that. Um, and that, Give us that the series. title for the, for the listeners as well. Sorry, my dear I, I should actually. This, the, 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 YouTube, the YouTube people get all, all of the highlights, but there we go. They but, do. So. Armageddon and Okra uh, by Lewis Fredrickson and looks at uh, one squadron's, one squadron RWF. I should say, operations in the Middle East during the World War One period, but also how it was somewhat mirrored by their return to hmm. the fight against ISIS and in and the Levant in Iraq and Syria, you know, from the old Bristol fighters and even earlier stuff than that to F-18 Super Hornets, which we're still using. And that, that was the start of the, the, the RWS campaign series, uh, which they're still doing. And they've done themes as they've gone through uh, various various years. So um, I think mean, last year might have been early last year. They just tailed off with the the Vietnam series, um, and they've done. I mean, look, there's the pile. 
which isn't going to help people on the radio, on the, listening to the <laughs> listening to the sound. Sorry, but they're published by Big Sky Publishing, you know, here in Australia. That's the the, the publisher that's got the contract with the Air Force. Yeah, if you can get hold of the Australian Air Campaign series, they are incredible value for money. Uh, they're usually pushing hundred, well over 150 pages for most of them, softback, and they usually run at about $20 here in Australia. Uh, I think they must be subsidised, I'm guessing, but uh, bang for your buck is what it's all about with that with that series. And there's profiles in there. I've worked on most of them except for, funnily enough, the one I haven't worked on is the only World War II aviation one they've done, <laughs> that of the Atlantic <laughs> by, by John Quaife. Uh, which is talking about uh, 10 and 461 squadron, the Sunderland squadrons okay. yeah. in the Atlantic in Coastal Command. Yeah, the one I have not worked on is the World War II one, which I would have loved to have worked on. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, Korean War, uh, Owen Zupps uh, released a very different war uh, in that series. He's got a fair bit of uh, experience writing about Korea because his father flew meteors with the Air Force there, part of left there. Mm. Um, and they've recently done, recently released, as I said, several Vietnam titles. Uh, some have been new editions of existing books. We've just gone through and edited them to the, current, the Air Force's current style. And then they've been updated with photos and profiles and that sort of thing. And they've done First Nation aviators, so uh, Aboriginal, oh, Indigenous yeah. heritage people in the Air Force, so who weren't actually allowed to join up. Um, up until ooh, the fifties, I think, off the top of my head. So, but a, a lot of them did during World War Two. Uh, so that that that's a and a, a very um, major contributors to the Air Force. Oh, actually, all of Australia's defence forces now. Which and that that was fantastic to to edit, seeing the, where everyone's come from, the different backgrounds, and how they everyone works together but that's yeah that's the air force it's always been a great melting pot and i think there's been the most recent one has been uh, women in the air force so they're really rather than just doing the history sort of thing they're looking at the various uh communities and uh i guess populations for one of the better explanation yeah. of those who have those who have served in the royal australian air force but um haven't necessarily had the recognition. That sounds fascinating. We'll, we'll, we'll stick some links into the into the description for all those as well. And yeah, I dribbled on a bit there. Something. No, no, it sounds it sounds all good. Right. So your your other side of the coin is, as you mentioned, aircrew book review, which is how how we met back back in the day on on the old Facebooks. Thank you for that because you've introduced me to some some great books which are up on the shelves over there. So what we thought we would do would be as we, you know, as you have access to many, many of these books and uh, stealing a bit of your time to, to talk about a few and just sort of give some, some of your favorites that you've, you've gone through either recently or, or, or of all time and just give sort of a little review to, we can get, get a plug for. And also this is selfish, which means if they sound interesting to me, I can reach out and get the author. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I think, um, good. The, the algorithm is insatiable. Yes. <laughs> I, I sometimes think I don't need an algorithm. I just need to, I, I do need to stay off stay off things and stop looking at covers of books and mm. yes. It's yeah, it's um it's a bit much at times. But, uh, but but before we get cracking on that, why why did you for someone who's editing books all day, why did you start a blog to start reviewing them as well because surely surely you'd want to do something else than, oh, this, than do that yeah. yeah well actually it's it's kind of a roundabout story because um mm -hmm. the editing came well after aircrew book review aircrew book review has oh, been right. going since about 2005 or thereabouts mm -hmm. uh very neglected at the moment because of the editing so that's <laughs> so the editing grew out of the book review thing, book review side of things, and now the book review side of things is quite neglected. For a book reviewer, I don't get to read as much as I want to. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I initially just thought I was into books in general. Uh, I was noticing a lot of US Army Air Forces titles that are really easy to get hold of. I'm thinking, well... Hang on, where's the RWF stuff? Where's the RF stuff? Yeah, silly me. It's not 
you know, early days of the internet sort of thing. Where's all the bo- all, the, all the RF bomber command stuff and things? And yeah, there's already heaps there, but it just took a while for that presence to make itself known. <laughs> and I, I, I just got stuck in really. It's, uh, I thought, well, these books need an online presence. Uh, so why don't I read them and dribble some crap about them online? Uh, yeah, it just. Not that there's any, not that no one dribbles crap online at all, you know. <laughs> and so the whole, the whole, the whole point was, I wanted to get the books in front of as bigger pop, uh, bigger audience as possible. But also, we're not all made of money, so people got limited budgets for these sort of things. So, can I make a decision on whether this book is worth my time to go off and buy? Uh, and so that's 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 how I always looked at the reviews. Uh, yeah, value for money, production, quality, uh, the read, of course, what it's about. Uh, probably give the game away a bit too much with some of the reviews, but um, it's, <laughs> yes, yeah, some, sometimes, yeah, it's just like, well, far out, you know, this book is well and truly worth, worth your time. And uh, again, as I said with the, the, with the editing, it's, it's a privilege to, re- to read and review a book anyway, to have the opportunity to actually be able to, talk about something, talk about it uh, online and, you know, have about five people listen to you. So it's, um, um, yeah, grew out of that. It just, I was doing that. I started writing reviews for Flight Path magazine down here in Australia. Um, I then came on board with them, James Kitely, Rob Fox and um, Ron Watts to as a contributing editor and did that for five years until they shut us down. Um, the publisher shut us down. And <laughs> yeah, just make that clear, otherwise you'll have James on to you in a second. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. The, 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 the publisher shut us down, that's for sure. Um, we were, God, that was good fun. A lot of work, um, but God, great fun. But that working in, with the magazine opened up a few doors. I'd already done a bit of work with Alan and Unwin, a publisher down here in Australia. Um, and I've done a bit more with them since. But I got contacts with the Air Force, and that's how I've started. I've been doing a lot of work for the past, well, oh, golly, five, six, seven years for History and Heritage Branch, uh, mm-hmm. and still do. Um, and yeah, it's just gone from there. You've got to be cheeky on occasion, and uh, you know, you want some, you want some editing done. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, other times it's been, uh, for example, I mean. Uh, Ian Campbell, who your your reading is Don Bennett, first volume of the Don Bennett biography, Relentless Skies. Uh, Super. He, yeah, it is, and that's got nothing to do with me, actually. By the way, um, although I I did edit it, but Ian's bloody good at what he does. I edited his first book, thinks he's a bird, which is just about an Australian uh, Queenslander who is a Pathfinder pilot, uh, relative of Ian's. And he put in touch with me through another author called Tony Brady, who wrote a book called The Empire Has, an answer, has the Answer. And Tony basically said, oh, if you, you're after an editor, you know, he's a guy. And we've gone from there. So it's, yeah, it's kind of grown. It doesn't make a living, but which is why I have another job. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it just keeps on keeping on and it's a privilege. Fantastic. So, yeah, right. So, 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 so for the, the reviews, big. Created the edit work and the edit works now caused me to neglect a lot of reviews, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, this is how we started talking about this, really, was you said you were struggling to get some time. And I thought, well, let's mm-hmm. let's see what happens if we can get together and um, get some some reviews out there, get the, yeah. the yeah. listeners and the viewers and I might, some, I might some, some make options. Some sense as well. I might actually make some sense. You never know. <laughs> that's, that, that's what the edit's for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what's the first book? We'll sort of do the same sort of format. What's the book? Who's the author? Yeah. What's it about? And then you give us your take from it. Well, first one I'm going to hold up here is uh, Stanford Tuck, the Helen Doe biography of the Battle of Britain Ace, of course, uh, by Grub so, Street. Some, someone, yeah, someone else I've spoken to and haven't had on yet. I'm sorry, Helen. We <laughs> we, we will chat. <laughs> cool, cool. And the cool thing about Grub Street, and sorry to the people who are only listening, the once take dust cover off, they re- replicate the um, mm. uh, the cover image on the actual hard boards, which you don't have to do. 
but that's a nice little, you know, extra that they do, that um, Grub Street does. Now, it's the previous biography of Tuck was uh, Larry Forrest's Fly for Your Life. And as Helen is at pains to do, that's a fair bit of fiction uh, embellishment. Uh, and it, it's mm-hmm. not necessarily Forrester doing it himself, although that's probably where a lot of it comes from. I think from what Helen was able to work out in her dive into the, the character of Tuck, he tended to embellish a few things as well. But that's that's kind of standard, I think, to some extent. I mean, you, there's a lot of, uh, you know, 10 years down the track, 20 years down the track, 30, 40, life gets in the way and you start remembering things differently anyway. It's just like we're wide. It's, it's a particularly good read. It, it, it starts off a bit uh, slow and early on as, as she tries to, I think she tries to get to grips and make some sense out of his early life before the RAF, which is always a tricky thing because this, you know, the records aren't necessarily going to be there. Yeah. And she makes a good fist of it uh, and also manages to start um qualifying a lot of what Forrester wrote <laughs> and some of the things he's just like okay right okay that's made up cool um <laughs> and yeah, early days in the RAF always a good thing to, to read about uh, particularly pre-war uh it's always an interesting time because you can see how those guys who are subsequently successful cut their teeth um and a lot of the time, that's why they were successful because of what they did pre-war. They didn't have to rush for themselves through training or anything like that. So, uh, and a lot of luck, of course, a lot of luck and a bit of skill there to you know not get knocked down in your second sortie, second operational sortie or something like that. So it tracks through really nicely. Uh, it's particularly fascinating his time in uh, the POW camp uh, after his after he shot down. Um, that that's a really in depth yeah. look, and she she gives as much detail uh, post-war as well uh, with his various business ventures and um, also, you know, the, his part in the Battle of Britain hero post-war as one of the one of the, the big guys, so to speak, you know, like Barter and people like that. Uh, it does suffer a little bit from, <laughs> with my editing hat on, um, there's... Every now and then, I'll, I'll, you, you come across a sentence. You go, I've got to read it two or three times to actually. Oh, okay, that's what that's what they're trying. That's what they're saying. And yeah, so it, I think it needed a bit of a tighten up there. But uh, from a biography point of view, it's it's pretty much the standard that you want for these type of guys. You know, we've we've all read you know, the likes of Foresters, the Reach for Your Skies, the Dam Busters, the Wooden Boss, that sort of thing. And yet yeah, they're, I guess, eternal classics. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we would have read a lot of those when we were teenagers, and mm. they're, they're very much of their time, aren't they? It's that sort of style that Brickhill and, and them set that you just had all of these things being turned out in the fifties and sixties. And I've Absolutely. I've got first edition of Foresters over, over there on the shelf, and it's yeah. it's an interesting read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and Helen, I mean Helen's got. Uh, I mean, she's written about her dad. Bob Doe, mm-hmm. uh, yep. and she's also written um, Maritime History as well, I think SS Great Britain and something else. I can't remember now. They're on the shelf somewhere, that sort of stuff. Uh, basically, she's written aviation, but then she's also written that, that sort of thing, so Maritime History. So I go, right, well, I need to understand more about this author, so I'm going to buy those as well. It's a vicious – It's well, it's a rabbit hole. Of many mm-hmm. that I disappeared yeah. but um, so her her research and vetting is just phenomenal, uh, and the the book really stands up. Uh, I've got I've got a few benchmarks that I set for biographies when I read them and review them, and uh, this is this is right up there. So fantastic! No, I I've, I I Helen, if you're watching and listening, I apologise. I will be in touch again. It's um it, it's just one of those ones that's been floating around. So I'm really pleased. I've heard lots of good things about it. So it's great that it's... So what's the title one more time? Uh, Stanford Tuck, Hero of the Battle of Britain, The Life of the Great Fighter Race by Helen Doe from uh, Grub Street. And good to see Grub Street still, you know, 
they've done a lot of Cold War stuff lately. It's really good to see them still putting out the Second World War titles. I mean, they for well thirty years now they've been one of the the leaders in that sort of subject. So it's it's good to see them, and and their production values have really increased um, above a pretty high high level that they already had. So. Fantastic back catalog to have a grub street. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some great authors. Right? Okay, what's book number two, sir? Uh, this one's a bit different, actually. It's um, and I'll try and I'll pick another one that's probably Australian next. But um, this is Ken Eighty from AEDY from mm-hmm. Biplanes to Fast Jets, and for those of you seeing the video, it's massive. Um, not what I was expecting when it turned up. It's pushing coffee table book size, really, and it's well, it's a, at least it's a four size in hardback, so it's a, it's a big size. But uh, he I'm trying to remember early seventy three, no, yeah, early seventy three. He had the first of three heart attacks in three months, uh, and this is after a, a life uh, a long long service in the RAF Ministry of Defence. Uh, he was 49 at the time, and he was pretty crook from then. Sorry, ill. Sorry, that's uh, crook. Um, <laughs> I, I was, was going to put a little cash it up. For not us, he's crook. Maybe. <laughs> he, he was unwell. He was unwell from about that time to when he died in, uh, I've got there, November 2001. Uh, but from that time, he'd been writing his memoirs. In fact, I think he'd been writing. He was writing on the day he died. And so he got to, I think, 1957, and so the kids have added to his life. The kids have you know, been responsible for these kids have been responsible for this book, and they've added to his story from 1957 onwards. But he, he joined the RAF, trained in Oklahoma, uh, arrived with Bomber Command quite late, so I think uh, March 45. So didn't see a lot of action, but was involved in Operations Manor and Exodus. Uh, so the, the dropping of the food to the Dutch and then, of course, bringing, repatriating the prisoners of war. Um, post-war, he didn't demob. He stayed in, became a qualified flying instructor, um, ended up in Singapore, got married in Singapore, back to the UK in the early 50s, meeting all night fighters, javelins. Uh, so there's kind of a bit of everything there, particularly for the Cold War nuts uh, and Grub Street, you know, going back to Grub Street. They've done a lot of Cold War stuff recently. But this is, yeah, javelins, meteors, that sort of thing. It'll get people excited. But um, And it's being a big book, it's allowed the, the publishers or the to give some full spray, full, full page spread photos. Some are stock photos, some are from... Ken's own, own history itself. Uh, the captions for the stock photos are a bit hokey because of the original captions. They haven't done any effort. They haven't done anything to kind of make them any different, which um, really stands out from the, the captions that are the original photos from his collection, which are much more detailed and uh, of, the, of the right style for his writing. But after the RAF, he ended up in Cyprus. He worked for the Ministry of Defence, UK Strike Command, and then I think he ended his career with uh, the NHS. Uh, so pretty much a life of service, really, to yeah. to the community, both military and, and and civil. So it just blew me. It's a big book. <laughs> it's it's not it's <laughs> it's not one you can kind of read in bed. Um, uh, oh, I mean, if if you dropped it, you probably break your nose, sort of thing. Um, if you if you nod it <laughs> off, but uh, it's the presentation and the, the production values again. One of the things that you know, I always go on about from a value, of my, value for money point of view, just mm-hmm. top notch mm-hmm. and a really different way of presenting a memoir slash biography, which is what it is because it's he only got to um, 1957 uh, before he died with his memoirs. So yeah. really quite impressive. So that's um, actually even though the publisher is, to be honest, I think White Fox Publishing in partnership with Mark Eighty, which who's his son. So that's um I guess he actually only came out this year. So from biplanes to fast jets, a pilot's life in the Royal Air Force, uh forty two to seventy three. Ken eighty, A E D Y. Yeah, I that, I is, that, that long... looks a hefty tome. <laughs> it is. It is. It's um that's that was the biggest when it arrived I'm like, what's this? 
because uh, <laughs> I do run into the problem of things turning up. I'm like, oh, I don't remember buying that, but um, I wonder what this is. <laughs> and it popped out and, yeah, quite impressed, quite impressed. So Super. And number hmm. three, sir. Yeah. We're uh, rattling through these ni- yeah. ni- nice and quick, which means we can we can talk about Ian's book at the end, I think. But. Yeah, cool. Uh, well, I, I'm going to do two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. In that case, Ian I, I, may have to wait. He's getting his own show, anyways. I know. No. We, we, won't, we won't be long. Uh, I've actually another Grub Street one solo to Darwin, so a bit of a Australian con- connection there. Commercial pilot. She's dyslexic, suffered from breast cancer, and then in 2018, sort of thing. Thought, right, I'm going to fly to Australia. As you do. Um, of course, sorry. This is solo to Darwin by Amanda Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> in the footsteps <laughs> of Amy Johnson, again by Grub Street. 30 years ago, flying a tiger moth from England to Australia was, you know, made national news here. Uh, there's a, a couple of um, Australians that did it. And even back then, it was a bit of a challenge from a political point of view. And you can't really follow the flight paths, the routes, and do all the stops that the pioneers did because some people don't like you landing in the country. And Amanda ran into this problem and she also ran into uh, mechanical issues as well. Uh, so she was up against it, really. <laughs> and and not, I don't, I'm trying really hard not to say what the outcome is, but um, it didn't go as well as she intended, put it that way. Mm. But flying a tiger moth anywhere beyond your own country, she's beyond your own state, county, whatever, um, is a challenge in these this day and age, especially when you're now having to deal with drones, uh, not just other aircraft. So, And a tiger moth, great machine that it is, it, it is obviously of another age, which makes the challenge all that much more harder. But she, she did well. And the book is written in kind of a very active voice. Uh, so it, it really adds to the the personal feel of it all, the, particularly she's very open about what she's struggling with, uh, honest, uh, and from a, I guess you'd call it a, a modern aviation adventure, it's it's one that you want on your shelf if you're into that sort of thing. And, I mean, you know, flying a Tiger Moth far out, doesn't matter whether it was written 50 years ago or written yesterday, it's it's it's, it's just absolutely fascinating. So um, that's a good one to get hold of if you can. And it's and really good to see female writers in historic aviation as well. That's that's one of the big things. I mean, it's, it's very much regarded as a domain of men, but this is the sort of stuff I love to champion. Uh, and so this is Solo to Darwin by Amanda Harrison. Uh, I've actually just recently edited a book about the history of Rose Bay in Sydney, which was the flying boat base, and that was written by a local lady there, partly for Sydney Seaplanes, which is the business that operates out of the base now, or well, what's left of the base. Uh, so that people like her and in Australia here, Christian Alexander, um, Helen Doe, of course, as we, as we talked about before, it's just absolutely fantastic that everyone has the opportunity to, get, to have a go at this sort of thing. And you, you notice, particularly when you're editing, that the, the attention to the detail is different just from person to person, but also, you know, female author to male author. That it's uh, it's just endlessly f- uh, fascinates me. <laughs> it's just, um, and, you know, which is why every book is every book is a privilege, as I said. But okay, moving on, so we can talk about Ian. Um, no, Ian no, just wants- we'll, we'll 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 get to him in a second. But you're you're quite right there that there can be a bias, especially with crusty middle aged white bloke like like myself that you tend to pick up and have an unconscious bias from time to time, mm. but there's something from, you know, the, the female authors I've had on it and read as well. The viewpoint is different enough to make the subject even more interesting because you're learning so, so much more. Um, and for, 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 for you, the dear watcher and listener, I do notice that the, the viewerships and listening chips are much lower for female guests when I have them on. Don't do that. Pick the pick those books up and, and watch those as well. Because, as yeah, as Andy's saying, it's taking a perspective you know and flipping it, and you're going to learn something fascinating from it. So don't 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 be a bloke. 
Mm-hmm. That's just, that's that's my, my my public service announcement for the the day. But anyways, can continue, sir. But that's that's just an observation I I I had to make on that one. No, 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 and and, and justifiable. Australian fleet air arm has had well hasn't had a lot of attention mm-hmm. over its entire period of existence, which is uh, just after the Second World War. Really, that it came in with uh, the carriers Melbourne and Sydney being well. And the bit of toing and froing we had there with ships being laid and all that, but I won't get into that. Um, <laughs> so the father of the Royal Australian Navy's fleet air arm is this chap. This is Admiral V.A.T. Smith, also known as, I think he called himself VAT or V.A.T. I haven't heard it in speaking, so I don't know. Uh, the Extraordinary Life of the Father of Australia's Fleet Air Arm by Graham Lunn. And this is published by... Uh, Avon Moore Books in South Australia, who I didn't work on that book, sadly, because, you know, it's World War II. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I, have, I have worked on – it's just the, way, just the way that things fall. But um, I did work on Avon Moore's two previous fleet air around books, Flying Stations 2 and The Skyhawk Years. So Avon Moore's making a real effort to get Australian fleet air arm history out there and – this is the result. Uh, although I said, you know, the Australian fleet air arm didn't exist until after the war, there were several Australians flying in the Royal Navy's fleet air arm, and that's been a fascination of mine as well because there weren't many. And so Smith ended up, after, you know, the obligatory tours on cruises and stuff like that, he ended up an observer uh, on swordfish and saw, saw, saw some action, uh, including its, uh, the, the German battle cruisers. And then without giving the game away too much post-war, he was instrumental in, in getting the uh, the fleet air arm, fixed-wing fleet air arm, operating off carriers. And, mm. yeah, it's it then follows his career through and also the development of the fleet air arm. Uh, we lost our fixed-wing capability in the early 80s when Melbourne was paid off, so the Skyhawks were sold to New Zealand. So the fleet air arm now, the front line assets, I suppose, uh, Seahawk Romeos. And, of course, they've, you know, the, the big base at Nowra, where they do their training and their operational base and, of course, deployments on board frigates and the rest of our Navy ships. But this, the production qualities, oh, again, of this book are just phenomenal. I mean, and his story, once you get stuck into it, he survived the sinking of HMS Canberra when the Japanese uh, hit it off uh, Savo Island. Catapult Ferry Farmers. Off merchant ships, mm. yeah, it's <laughs> it's just you're just like, <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, you know, ended up you know chief of staff in the seventies, that sort of thing. It's just oh, for me as an Australian, it, it's the Australian Air Crew Book of of the Year for me. It's just oh, yeah, can't say enough about about it. So. Super. So is, is that just style that it's written his life, the, the or the the whole the whole thing is just. Keep, well, keep keeps look, you engaged. I, I guess it's it's easy um, because it's a fascinating life, uh, and because mm-hmm. he had such a long military life, there's lots of the, lots of um, record of what he did yeah. there as well. But um, the author is from a naval background as well, uh, and I think served a fair bit of time in the New Zealand Navy as well, uh, and then went flying airlines. Uh, airliners and then retired to New Zealand. And he, one of his passions is getting the history of the Australian fleet air arm out there to more people as well. So very much a man after my own heart, even though I don't have any naval background. I just find it, for some reason, the fleet air arm just fascinates me. <laughs> um, so, I mean, a lot of the stuff, the books behind me and on the floor and up there and over there, I'm just eternally looking for fleet air arm biographies and there are some that are just... I've never heard of, and you get stuck into them, and you're like, oh, whew. one, how did you survive? Two, what the hell were you doing when you did this? It's, 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 oh, it's just, yeah, ridiculous, really. But, yeah, it's that's mm. that's a lot of thing. I mean, these books are full of just normal people doing remarkable things, and that, that that's what is, I think, one of the one of the big things that gets me so. Fantastic. Do we want to talk about Ian? Yeah, oh, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Well, only because I've, I've I've literally got pages of it left, and I've just been yeah. enthralled, and it's mm, a fantastic, mm. fantastic. But and it, the book and it's is only volume one. So, 
I know, and so, that's why it's so because <laughs> he stops it right in the bit. You're like, don't stop this. So it's it's relentless, guy. Yeah. So it's a biography of um, Air Vice Marshal Don Bennett, who most famous for most readers, I would suppose, is the commander of the Pathfinder Force during World War II. In my mind, not the interesting thing that he did, and it's all the stuff I've been reading about flying with Imperial Airways, the the Mayo composite with Mercury utterly mind-blowing and nuts just nuts yeah let's let's put a four engine float plane on top of a c-class flying flying boat and extend our range for a bit and then you realize actually he's literally just using it to take off mad absolutely mad but we're gonna have ian on because the book's out in uh middle of november yes yep. but i just wanted to speak to someone else who's read it because it's beautifully done it is absolutely mm. beautifully done. And and as he says in the introduction to it, very Aussie. <laughs> well, a Queenslander would say that about a fellow Queenslander. So <laughs> I'm, I'm West Australian, so um, on the other side of the country. Uh, yes. And, yeah, it is. Um, and, I mean, it's uh, written by Australian, edited by Australian, me, and published by in Australia, although having said that the editor and the publisher are both in West Australia, so for Queenslanders to get anything done, well, they've got to use West Australians. But yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got to get that in because <laughs> Ian, Ian will enjoy that. But, no, he, he, he's just the most – Ian I'm talking about. He's just um, – he has access to the Bennett Archives in the Queensland Aviation Museum and is the, I think, effectively the curator of that part of the collection. And he's uh, – documenting a lot of it and, you know, cataloguing um, the whole thing. And he just – there is no stone unturned, uh, left unturned with, with Ian. He just – he'll follow something to its absolute death. Um, and he thinks he, – he's appreciative of what I do. Apparently I keep him honest and, um, you know, velvet hammer sort of thing to some extent. But uh, I <laughs> – I really don't need to. <laughs> um, the the manuscript comes, and I mean, he, he, as he's right, he, he'll be back and forth, back and forth with me as he's going through it and bouncing stuff off me. Uh, uh, this will make his head really big, but he doesn't really need, need the help. The the, <laughs> the 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 research and the, the the crafting and the getting actually into the head of Bennett. I mean, his, his previous book was, as I said, was Thinks He's a Bird about a Queensland, uh, another fellow Queenslander who, a relative of his who ended up in Pathfinders, did a tour with Pathfinders. Uh, and he said that it's him and his wife at, at home, but Keith was also there, was living with them. And then when he started the Bennett one, you know, Keith moved out and Don Bennett moved in. And <laughs> really, Don Bennett would be quite the challenging housemate. <laughs> to be honest, quite the demanding house, mate, because he's probably, of all the leaders of the RF at that time, he's probably the most misunderstood, I think, uh, simply because he had high expectations. So if, if he expected you to be up to speed with what he was up to speed with, if you weren't, he wanted to see that you were making an effort to do it. And if you weren't doing that, you're not worth, not worth his time. So... <laughs> But, I think that's a very polite way of putting it. <laughs> yep, yeah, he, he, he was didn't suffer fools, which, and that's probably another yeah. nice way of putting which, it. <laughs> which comes which comes across in his own memoir, doesn't it? In, in Pathfinder, mm, mm. it's it, yeah, it, it's that classic, slightly axe grindy thing, and the 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 sparks with him, Harris Cochran. No, no, Cochran, it, yeah, it, yeah. Oh, and, and again, um, that's that's a, a, you know, Ian's having to counter what Bennett wrote in his own biography, autobiography, I should say, sorry, um, because, again, there's, you know, how I see myself and how someone else sees me and, yeah, and we're also now we're talking 80 years later sort of thing as well. So, yeah, it's – uh, Ian actually is going to be in England next year too, come around May, I think, so he's going to do some events in, uh, in England. So hopefully the book will – do well up there as well as it should. So we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be giving it a, a, a big old plug here. And it's, I think may I'll, I'll put the dates in there, but may at the international bomber command center, he's, he's doing mm. a, 
a thing that I have seen with um, with Dan and everybody up there, which will be great. That's right, yeah, I, I just want yeah. to take 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 a second just to talk about that because I've I didn't know what to expect going in. And there's the fantastic bit in the the foreword where he's like, I'm an Australian writing about an Australian. I'm calling him Don. Don't care what you yep. think. I'm just like, I'm in. Yep. Happy days. Just go go for it. And, and that was the fun thing with the Helen Helen Dode, the Tuck book as well, because you'd have mm. she, there was you talk about Tuck, and then the next sentence would be it'd be Bob or Robert sort of thing. So there's kind of a bit all over the place. Whereas yeah, Ian Ian's gone right now. Nah, I'm calling him Don. That'll do. <laughs> yeah. So so there you go. That's Relentless Guys. That's that's out. I think it's out in about a month here in the UK. I've just had a look at the the Amazon listing. Fourteenth of November. Yeah. Launch, We're uh, get launch is launch is late November. So yeah. Mm. We're, we're going to get Ian on and um, have have a, have a chat with him, which means another early morning for me. Very early because he's, he's on the other the other side, is he? Yeah. Yes, three, he's the current daylight savings there three like three hours ahead of us at the moment. So um, mm. they're having their lunch when we're kind of just getting started. So joy. So getting up early to chat to you, even earlier to chat to Ian. But but there we go. <laughs> so let let let's run through the the recommendations then. So it's um, Helen Doe's. Um, Bob Sanford Tuck book. Um, all of the links will be descriptions and things below. Um, what were the other ones? Well, uh, I don't Solo need to, to these. You, you've got Amanda them in Harrison. front of you. Yep. yep. Solo to Darwin and, by and, Amanda Harrison. And just to say on, on the Amanda Harrison one, um, check out um, Aviation Extended's interview with her because it's, yes. it's brilliant. Um, I, I had Amanda on the list and then I listened to Peter interviewing her and went, yeah, just nah, keep it important. No, no point to that. Now, Pete, 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 <laughs> yeah, Peter smashed it. Uh, Relentless Guys by Ian Campbell, of course. Uh, yep. Gra- Graham Lunn's Admiral VAT Smith, uh, which, well, everyone's a sucker for a swordfish. So that artwork is just, was commissioned for the book, too, by the way. Um, oh, brilliant. And, yeah, and Ken 80s from biplanes to fast jets. Super. And we, we also talked about a fair bit about the Australian, the RWF's uh, air campaign series. So if you can Google that, there's seven titles that's been released, hmm. something for everyone, pretty much. And I think off the top of my head, there's another three in the process at the moment. So Great. So give the blog that you are <laughs> <you're> neglecting <laughs> a, a, a plug where, <laughs> and maybe, maybe we can get you to be writing a bit more on it. Yeah, I do need to, actually. <laughs> um, it's Air Crew Book Review, which is a blog spot. But if you just Google Air Crew Book Review, it's gonna it's gonna that'll um, appear. And that's just RAF and Commonwealth uh, books by and about RAF and Commonwealth Air Crew. And there's another website, Flightline Book Review, which is if it's not RAF and Commonwealth in the Second World War, it's there. So Americans, Japanese, Germans during the war, uh, Cold War, Korea, everything. Uh, that's I actually have most. I have a lot of guest reviewers for that one, so it actually gets a bit more content put into it more regularly because I'm not the only one doing it. So, <laughs> uh, and, and it, yeah, if if I disappear down the rabbit hole of World War One or something else, uh, from a enthusiast's point of view, I've deliberately avoided that actually because World War Two is hard enough as it is. So, um, yeah, air crew book review. And, um, give it a whirl. Fantastic. This has been fun. I think we should we should do it again with, with, when you get another another batch ready to go. We'll, we'll we'll have you on. We can we can talk upcoming books and and. Um, I've too. I might make more sense then too. Ah, break breaking the ice <laughs> with this one. It's all good. You've been fab, super, Andy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for the opportunity. I cannot thank Andy Wright enough for joining us here on the Damcasters, and I hope you liked that whole editing books section because I found that fascinating because the finished product is just that finding out what all of those steps are along the way is really interesting to me because i've always wanted to know what an editor does and it's great to see that a lot of the time it can be many different things depending on the author so thanks to andy do check out aircrew book review and you know there's a facebook group as well which everyone puts their book reviews in too which is really useful for finding some of the guests i've had onto the show so check that out links are all in the description below like i said before if you want to have your name in the credits which are coming up in a second 
Join us on Patreon from just three pounds a month plus a bit of that. We've got a little welcome pack going together with a magnet with our logo on it. What more would you want, really? So do check all those out. And once again, thanks to Andy. Please like and subscribe. Do all the stars into your podcast app of choice if you're listening to this on the audio version. But it really does help our AI overlords to keep the podcast going. Podcast? Is it a YouTube channel? It's many things. It is one thing to all. So thank you so much for joining us. Next, the B-58 Hustler returns. I think you're going to like that one. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Bye-bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Dam Castiers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.